Okay, good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Wong Tae Kui. I'm a consultant cardiologist and I uh, run this once a month. And today we invite Professor Dr. Vinish uh, Varun to, to talk about uh, brain problem again because many GP has uh, PM me and say that they want to uh, learn more from uh, Professor Vignesh. So Prof Professor Vignesh, uh, you have known him from my previous talk, but I just uh, give a, a brief uh, introduction about him. He had his MBBS in 1990, so he's much older than me. And uh, he's the founder and head of the division of neurosurgery of University of Malaya. And he was also the previous uh, medical director of University of Malaya uh, Specialist Center. And he has published uh, many, many papers, which you can uh, you can find on the public domain. So with that introduction, I'll pass the floor to Professor Vignesh to talk about brain tumor. So in such a short time, he, he's going to teach us uh, a lot about brain tumor. So Professor Vignesh. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Uh, good afternoon to everyone who's taken time to come to listen to this uh, presentation. Yeah. So as I was saying, Dr. Wong, just a little while ago, um, I was quite heartened by the last presentation and that there was a lot of interest in the topic. There was head injury. And I thought another area that might interest you guys would be uh, on uh, brain tumors because uh, headache is one of the most common symptoms that you will see or get, you will meet. And, um, and and most people are worried, are they having a brain hemorrhage or are they having a brain tumor? So I will allow me to share my slides. Can you all see the slides? Yes, we can see the slide. Yep. Okay, so the, the topic for the day is going to be brain tumors, diagnosis and management. And um, during this uh, hour or so, uh, the first first thing that I like to cover is some of the symptoms and recognizing which ones are the problematic symptoms and which are not. Also to understand some of the investigations that we do in uh, working out the diagnosis, because sometimes uh, general practitioners initiate some of these investigations. And sometimes your patients may come to you asking you, do you need to do this test or this other test or whatever. And finally, to give an introduction to the kind of treatments that are available today. Uh, marketing is very big in neurosurgery and perhaps to give you some exposure of what's available and what's cutting edge in Malaysia. So just quickly, uh, uh, so I'm, my, uh, my idea is not to actually talk to you about brain tumors, the pathology and all that, uh, rather the presentation and the management of them. Um, but like every other tumor anywhere else, uh, they are classified as either benign or malignant. Yeah. The benign, but there's another important classification, which is whether a tumor is intraaxial or extraaxial. The axis that we talk about here is the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, and this is quite important because tumors arising within the brain and the spinal cord or intraaxial are more likely than not malignant. And those that are extraaxial, that means they are outside the brain and the spinal cord, but within the skull of the spine and pushing inwards, they are generally benign. So the common benign tumors are things like meningiomas, which arise from the meninges, or the more specifically the arachnoid cap cells, and schwannomas, which arise from the cranial nerves, the most common of which is the acoustic neuroma. Uh, you also get lots and lots of neuromas along the spinal cord and meningiomas. Then the malignant varieties are generally tumors that arise from the glial or the support cells. Tumors arising directly from the neuronal cells itself is uncommon. Uh, they are relatively less malignant than the glial tumors. So the glial tumors can be quite vicious. And probably the most common tumor that occurs in the uh, central nervous system are secondary are metastasis from other parts of the body. And in 10% of patients who present with a metastasis to the brain, we will not be able to find the primary despite intensive investigation. Now, um, headaches. Um, so it's a good start point, I thought, of this presentation because 70% of all, I, I read it many years ago somewhere that 70% of all, uh, in, in all consultations with GP, 70% of patients will complain or, of headache. Or somewhere in their complaints that they come to you with, there will be this complaint of headaches. 
but only less than 10% are sinister, okay? And uh, patients are constantly worried about headaches because you're constantly being bombarded about how you might have a brain tumor or a brain hemorrhage. And it is well known fact that when when there is a uh, when when someone within the family gets a brain tumor or a hemorrhage, or someone within the community or your place of work, there's a sudden surge of people uh, who develop headaches and who will go looking for help. So it is quite important to decipher the symptom of headache, something which is very very common and usually exceedingly benign. Now, the general symptoms that you see in brain tumors are headaches. Uh, and the headaches are usually described as being uh, uh, early morning. Uh, that's because the patient is supine when they are sleeping. And so the CSF pulls also in the intracranial cavity and the pressure goes up. Okay, And then the headaches, there's usually no specific side. Okay, uh, If a tumor, patients often ask me, oh, I've got a tumor on the right side, why is my headache on the left side? Honestly, I don't know. But most of the reasons you get a the reason you get a headache from is not because of uh, pain from the brain itself, but it's because of traction on the dura or traction on the cranial nerves, which have got nerves or sensory nerves going there. Now, um, the 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 pain of the headache uh, you can have very very large tumors and still have no headache. Okay, so that's the amazing part of it. So that that's big. Uh, that scan that I have there is a patient who's got a huge meningioma in the head. But that patient actually had very, very little symptoms. In fact, I believe this patient did not even have any headaches. The primary complaint was the family felt that there were some changes in the person's personality. Now, these headaches that come on are also associated with vomiting. And this is classically described as being projectile. That is because the patient vomits without any nausea. So unexpectedly, suddenly the patient just brings everything out and progressively lowered conscious level. So as a tumor starts to grow and compresses on the brain and they need to be quite big, then the patients start to be, become more and more sleepy until they start to uh, lose consciousness. Now, the reasons why the rise in ICP occurs is for two, two, two main reasons. One is it can be the mass of the tumor itself, like the picture that I've given you there. Or sometimes you can have a very small tumor, like the one in the lower scan, where the tumor is in a awkward position in that it is sitting in the brain stem or the midbrain, and it's compressing the aqueduct of Sylvius, and as a consequence of which the patient has developed secondary hydrocephalus. Now remember, CSF forms at the rate of 20 cc per hour, and there is about 100 cc of CSF in your cranial cavity. And this CSF has to circulate and find its way out. So if you block the CSF flow, it is more dangerous than the tumor growing because the CSF pressure will build up very quickly. Other symptoms often will depend on where the tumor is actually located. So uh, if a tumor is located along the speech area, like the first scan, uh, the brain scan, which shows a dark lesion occupying the temporal lobe, the patient may have a variety of speech problems. It may be general, uh, patient may have generally diffi general difficulty in understanding and speaking, or some people may have expressive dysphasia or receptive dysphasia. If a tumor occupies the region of the motor cortex, they may present with hemiparesis. Or like the second scan that you see, this is an acoustic neuroma. So as the tumor grows, the patient starts to develop tinnitus first, and then develops loss of hearing. And, and then as it compresses the brain stem, the patient starts to have balance problem. Or they can have loss of smell, like this huge olfactory groove meningioma you see in the lower scan. Now, the funny thing about losing the sense of smell, most people don't even realize that they have lost the sense of smell. The same thing with an acoustic neuroma. Uh, there are many patients that I've noticed, they did not realize that they have actually lost their hearing in one year. So what happens is they start to use most of us are right-handed, so we tend to use our mobile phone on our right side. And then we may find that the hearing is not that good, so we will subconsciously move it to the left side. And progressively, we will just stop using the right ear. And we, don't, we are not even uh, consciously aware that we have actually stopped using the right ear for our phone uh, is because we have become deaf. And the progression is over months and years. So it is not sudden. Until one day, the patient just picks up the phone and suddenly puts it on the ear and it cannot hear anything. And suddenly they're shocked 
how come I'm not hearing anything? So that's how they, they suddenly realize that they cannot hear or suddenly one day they uh, there's a very strong foul smell and they cannot smell, but everybody else can smell it and they realize that they have lost the sense of smell. So it can be quite sudden, but actually this has been building up over months and years. So this is quite different from patients who come in with problems with speech or confusion or patients who come in with uh, hemiparesis. Uh, there the patients come in um, much sooner. Then, of course, there are special, what I call special symptoms. These are seizures. Patients who develop seizures, either generalized or focal, like from the patient who's got the top scan, or patients with a pituitary adenoma who may present with other than focal symptoms because of compression of the optic chiasm and suddenly start to realize that they are crashing into objects on one side or they're having difficulty reading. Or when they have uh, hormonal uh, issues such as a prolactinoma causing lactation or patients starting to demonstrate features of acromegaly or Cushing's disease where suddenly the blood pressure is very high and they're Cushing on. And one would be quite surprised how long sometimes people take to have these conditions diagnosed. And the patients will be having florid Cushing's disease before they actually come and present to us. Uh, yeah. So in this day and age, uh, when I was a medical student, and as Dr. Wong has elucidated, it's quite a long time ago, uh, uh, we used to have strict rules about when we do a scan. Today, if a patient develops a scan for a, a seizure for the very first time, I think it'll be a very brave man not to put the person into the scan and just call this a simple epilepsy. Yeah? Now, the most important thing, the most important thing with all these features is that in brain tumors, the history is usually progressive, okay? It extends over weeks, months, and years. So if a patient presents to you with a headache of one day duration or two days duration, or sometimes even a few days, it's probably not a brain tumor, right? And the headache is usually over a period of time, and the headache is usually worsening. So the headache becomes progressive. It was initially, the headaches may occur once every third day or fourth day, then it starts to get more frequent and even more frequent, and sometimes the headache is constant, right? So, and 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 be very careful with patients who are having lots of headaches to label them. It's quite common to see patients being labeled as having migraine, and uh, when in, in actual fact, they actually have a brain tumor because the headaches, migraines don't occur every day or every week or something like that. Yeah, migraines occur quite far apart, and and and, and be careful of labeling people. It's also not uncommon for patients to have been diagnosed as when they develop a hemiparesis, especially among the older patients. Uh, some, some people think that they're having dementia. Uh, sometimes it's penyakit orang tua. Uh, sometimes they are diagnosed, um, you know, as having had a stroke. Now, strokes occur very suddenly. So you're well in one moment and the next moment you cannot move something. But these patients, if you look at the history, they have been progressively developing this weakness. So if you ask them the history, when exactly it started, how long have they had difficulty walking, and the history will probably stretch back over a few weeks rather than sudden in onset. So strokes are usually very, strokes are not usually, they are always very sudden. One moment you're well, next moment you are not. Now the usual investigations that we would do, these are general ones, Okay, so a uh, full blood count, electrolytes, liver function test. Now, if the patient has known to have a primary tumor, like a colorectal carcinoma, markers are useful. Uh, chest x-rays are useful, especially if you're suspecting a metastatic disease. So a chest x-ray will show you uh, the lesion in the lung, which is still one of the most common areas from where they metastasize to the brain. Now, when when we were when when at least when I was a medical student, everything was started off with an X-ray. But today in neurosurgery, we hardly ever use a skull X-ray. Hardly ever use a skull X-ray. Okay, the only time we indicate a skull X-ray is someone in a district hospital has a head injury. Uh, but having said that, sometimes when the when the skull is very thickened, if there's an underlying meningioma, for example, the picture on your top right, yeah. Or sometimes when there are lytic lesions of the brain, like a histiocytosis, uh, myelomas, uh, you can see the one at the bottom. So here you can see in a skull x-ray. But as a rule, we don't do skull x-rays anymore, right? Uh, we would probably, 
jump to a CT scan or an MRI scan if we have suspicion that this patient has a tumor of some sort. Now, CT scans of the brain. So uh, quite often we see patients who are coming to us from general practitioners who have suspected something and have org organized a CT scan. Now, CT scan is a very, very good start. Okay, The CT scans that are available today are very good. I would say almost 90% as good as an MRI scan. Uh, and uh, But it all depends on which hospital the scan gets done in, uh, how many slices they do and whatever not. Okay, Now, it's a good first test, especially if the history is not strong. So if I, you know, uh, it's very difficult if a patient comes to see me sometimes and they've been having headaches for like two weeks, three weeks. But deep down inside, you know that there's no brain tumor here. Uh, it's just um, stress headache or tension headache. But at the same time, you are worried to send the patient back and say, uh, everything's okay, don't worry about it. You know, So a CT scan is a good thing to do. It's relatively cost efficient. Uh, it costs a few, a few hundred ringgit. Um, and uh, I get as much answers as I want. Uh, and then um, the, the CT scan can be done very quickly, easily available. Okay, So it's good when you have calcification or you're having hemorrhage and things like that. Okay, And immediately post-surgery, quite often we will do CT scans if you're worried about complication like post-surgical uh, post hemorrhages. And sometimes we just do a CT scan before sending the patient home to just make sure everything is okay. Now, when a patient, so patients tell me, when they come and sit down in front of me and, 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 and they have been complaining of a headache and I really, really don't think they got a brain tumor and I order a CT scan, then it almost invariably they'll say, oh, my friend said to me, my neighbor said to me, I should get an MRI scan. Now, if that headache is going to be significant, then the lesion must be sufficiently big enough, which means the CT scan will pick it up. So we are not looking for some very fine lesions. So the MRI is really unnecessary. So the CT scan will pick up most problems easily, quickly, right? Uh, and it's painless on the pocket and painless on the time. So CT scans are very good. Now, on the other hand, if the patient has symptoms, right? Uh, in addition to the headache, there is headache plus, say, patient says he's feeling a bit weak or headache plus maybe there's a ringing in the ear. Uh, or maybe there's something to suggest something is going on in the posterior fossa, especially. So CD scans are not very good to look at lesions within the posterior fossa, simply because there's a lot of bone in that area and you may miss a soft tissue lesion. So in such an instance, you will go on to an MRI scan. Now, the MRI scan has become our mainstay, right? Um, when I was a medical officer in 1990s to 1995s, uh, you know, everything was CT scan, CT scan. Today we do MRI scans like we are ordering coffee. Okay. So uh, the university hospital has got, uh, I don't know, five MRI scanners and almost all of them are busy with the waiting time of two weeks for a scan. Okay. So uh, neurosurgeons started with a scan. Now the orthopedic surgeons have also got into the act. So the machines are being used thoroughly, right? So the main purpose in MRI is wonderful is because the images are exquisite. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very in detail, okay? You can have the images in various planes and based on the different sequences, you get different information, okay? So if you look at the three sets, they're all from the same patient. The top image uh, is what's called a T2 image where water is white in color. So I'm not sure if you're able to appreciate the arrow here. So if you look here, this is a, the gyri, the salsi, sorry. And you can see CSF in here. And you can see the density of this region, almost similar to CSF. So this is going to be something soft. This is a scan without contrast, without contrast. So you can see the lesion is actually sitting inside the parenchyma of the brain, compressing the ventricle. And this tumor has got multiple different densities, right? There's some areas that are very dark more closely, almost similar to CSF. And this is probably areas that have undergone necrotic change or some cystic change. And then some areas are not as dark, and these are probably fleshy tumors, which have a high water content, because their density is almost similar to the white matter of the brain. Okay, and when we give contrast, you can see that some areas here have picked up contrast. Some areas have picked up the contrast. So these are probably, so this is probably going to be a grade three or a grade four glioma. 
So even from the MRI scans, before we do anything more, uh, I can even reach a diagnosis. So it's an intrinsic brain tumor is enhancing with contrast. It's unlikely to be a low grade because it's a multi-density and it's got contrast. So, so I've got all that information from just these three pictures, right? Which the CT scan cannot do. So, but, but, but when MRI scans are done, they must be of good quality. They must be of good sequencing, sufficient thickness, slice thickness, okay? In addition to that, we can do spectroscopy. That means we can, we can put uh, cursors on the image and look at the pixels and we can tell the chemistry of this tumor and whether this is a glioma or it's a low grade or a high grade. Uh, today, we can even look at the oxygenation level and stuff like that and see whether uh, there's increased blood flow, et cetera, okay? I'll show you some of these other things. Uh, and uh, then there's functional imaging, where today, uh, when, when we want to operate on patients who have got tumors in the eloquent area, so for example, patients who have got a tumor in the uh, in the in the oh, along the motor strip, we can make them do actions in the MRI scan and to activate a section of the brain, and this will appear, and then we can tell whether the tumor is involving the motor cortex or is it pushing the motor cortex. And in the same way, we can also test speech. We can ask them to say certain words while they are or think certain words when they are in the MRI scan, and we can see these areas light up like a light bulb. Okay. And then when they when they write out like a light bulb, you can see whether this page, this area is involved with the speech or not. And then there's tractography. Tractography allows us to see all the various tracks going down, going up, going sideways. So when we resect this tumor, uh, we can try and avoid these things. And again, I will demonstrate that in a little while. So this is an MRI scan, a serial MRI scan with contrast. So the, the degree of anatomy, I can see. So this is a sphenoid ring meningioma. I can clearly see how it's compressing the brainstem. I can clearly see fibers going through it. And I can see the, uh, the what do you call that, the uh, anterior cerebral artery being encased within the tumor. And I can see the carotid artery here encased within the tumor. And you can see how clearly you can see the optic nerve. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, I think that's the optic nerve. And you can here you can see the cone of the muscles of the, op uh, optic, uh, of the, uh, of the eyeball. So the images are very, very good. Uh, we can get lots and lots and lots of anatomical image. I would not want to operate on a patient without an MRI scan for any brain tumor today uh, because the roadmap of an MRI scan cannot be replaced. And then we can look at the same image in multiple plane. I've got an axial plane. I've used the same, almost the same sequence, axial plane, sagittal plane, and coronal plane. So this, this is useful. Here you can see the hypoostosis of the skull. This is also a meningioma. You can see this black area here. Because it's black in color, I know that it's calcium. And this is a very thickened skull. And then this is the tumor. The tumor itself is relatively going to be relatively soft. So you can see that this tumor occupies the anterior one-third of the skull, which means that uh, the danger of any venous injury is actually quite low. And I can see it from the side. From here, I can say that that's where the motor cortex is very, very, it's miles away, right? And, and it's easy for me to show this picture to the patient and for me to explain to them and for them to understand where the tumor is. It is it, patients find it quite difficult to understand on the axial alone, but once you have one of these, all these three, it's not a difficult thing. Now, sometimes we still do angiograms. Uh, those of you who are even older than me and did some surgical rotation in your early days of training, before the advent of CT scan in Malaysia, sometime in the before the 1990s, if you had graduated, neurosurgeons used to do angiograms on patients directly without radiologists. And just to diagnose tumors, even move shift of the arteries in different areas to tell them where the pathology might be post-trauma. So we use it as diagnostic sometimes to look for very vascular tumors. And we also use them therapeutically for embolization. This is a patient that I think we operated on recently. So you can see that there's a huge blush here. And this is the, from the middle meningeal artery. And my interventional radiologist has successfully killed this tumor, right? And you don't see any more uh, enhancement after post-embolization. Now, post-embolization, uh, your patients may come and ask you, the doctor wants, surgeon wants to embolize me, what is that? So they stick some glue and stuff like that into the tumor. And that makes it safer to take out the tumor. And it's like, so between the left side and the right side, 
After the embolization, it will be like scooping out ice cream. On the left side, the patient will be bleeding like crazy and will be requiring huge gallons of blood to be transfused to do this operation. So uh, a lot of these, many of these tumors today, we may embolize it before doing surgery. Unfortunately, embolization costs a fair bit of money. And then for patients with pituitary tumors, we will need special uh, assays, uh, hormonal assays, uh, growth hormone, IGF-1, cortisol, free tyroxine, 3 and 4, and prolactin. For pineal tumors, we may do beta HCG and alpha fetoprotein, either from the blood or lumbar puncture. And in patients who have had seizures, we would do EEGs on them. Oh, sorry, my spelling of treatment is wrong. Okay, so treatment. So treatment, the, the main modality of treatment of brain tumors is still surgery, okay? We may do biopsies or we may do excisions. So tumors that are very deep in the brain and we think they are malignant, we may, we may go for biopsies and anything else, uh, we will do craniotomies. Now, most people are very afraid if someone tells them that I'm going to open your head and take out this tumor. Uh, I started my training in 1990. I'm still very actively operating as the year 2023. Neurosurgery management of brain tumors has changed like night and day. In the early 90s, 1995, patients were glad if they woke up alive. Today, most of my patients complain about their haircut or the dent they have at the side of the skull. Okay, So it has become a lot safer. Technology has become better. The training of the surgeons has improved. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate, show you some of these things. Okay, Now, this is a stereotactic biopsy. Okay, This is a 3D printed model. So this is uh, something that I do on my pastime for my research purposes. And... Uh, I can scan any of you and make you, and this is a child who had a brain tumor in the pineal region. And this is just to demonstrate a biopsy, okay? So this is what we call navigation. So we are tracing the shape of the face, and then we register to this camera system that can see. And the camera system can actually confirm where we are. This is like the navigation in your car. So then what we do is we are planning an entry point, and we are selecting a target on the patient. And this is exactly how we would do a burr hole as we raise the flap. And these models are made to be like human beings. Okay. Uh, okay. And I'm going to move this video a little bit forward. Sorry, let me go. So there we are drilling the skull. So I am going to reach a target in the pineal gland, which is about six centimeters deep, going past important structures, arteries, ventricles, things like that, through a burr hole, which is all located in the skin. So what we do is we select, oh, there you can see the target. So the target has been selected. We have selected the entry point. And based on the target and entry point, we can then assess our trajectory. As you can see, I'm scrolling down the images. So we're going very, very, very deep, deep, deep into your brain and try and avoid any important structure that exists in between. We have got the system that is very rigid, a biopsy arm, okay? And then this is, as I explained to patients, this is a semi-blind process. So we set the needle to the depth we want based on the measurements that we got from the scans just now. And because this patient's head is fixed, and the cameras are tracking us. So as the biopsy needle goes, it is tracking the biopsy needle, making sure it follows the same trajectory that I've selected. And then I have reached the tumor. I now perform a biopsy. And the biopsy is there. Okay. So this is a, uh, th I'm showing this to you on a model. I didn't want to show it to you on a real patient. So I can show you the whole thing. So this is a stereotactic biopsy. So if anyone wants to know how a stereotactic biopsy is done, this is how it's done, right? So we can hit any target in your brain at any depth quite safely without having to even see the tumor. So we don't actually see the tumor. So quite often I try and explain to patients that this is like when they launch a cruise missile, right? I select an entry point, I select a target and I launch. I can trace the entire journey of the cruise missile 
and I will sure it'll hit the target now. Unfortunately, just like the cruise missile, sometimes if there's a student or a child sitting in that same house, you won't be able to know that. So if you've got a small vessel in there, you cannot see and you've got a 4% risk of hemorrhage of which one of the 4% can be catastrophic. Okay, because we got we cannot see what we are doing. But it's a very, very, very safe procedure with a significant uh, with a risk, significant risk of being 1% or less. Right? And we can do a biopsy anywhere in the brain. So this is what we call a stereotactic biopsy. This is a stereotactic craniotomy. So all craniotomies, almost all craniotomies are done with the same principle. So gone are the days where we make big, big opening in the skull and still can't find the tumor. So today we use navigation. Okay, this is again a 3D printed model. And this is again our research published in 2013 on creating models for surgery. So this is a patient of mine who had a glioblastoma. Uh, let me, sorry, let me just start again. So we are registering the patient and we have marked the flap where the tumor is. So this guy had a cancer and we operated on him and then uh, he developed a glioblastoma and then he died. But today we use his models to train surgeons quite often. We are raising a flap. And this is exactly how we would do this operation on a real patient, how we raise a flap, except there'll be a little bit more bleeding in the skin. So you can see the probe and it can tell you exactly that you're on the bone. So that's how accurate the navigation is. We perforate a couple of holes in the skull. And then we perform a craniotomy and that's how we do a craniotomy. It's exactly like opening a milk tin. And that's the dural layer. And we open the dural layer and whatever is orange is the tumor. And as I cut open the dura to the extreme, you see a small yellow area coming into view. And that is supposed to be the normal brain. Okay. And that's the tumor. Now, also today, uh, I personally, I do a lot of, we do a lot of endoscopic procedures. So gone are the days of big operations to take out pituitary tumors through the head. Today, we operate everything through the nose. This is a two-man operation done by me, myself and an ENT surgeon. So in UC Hospital, we got a spe special team. So if you look at the scan, this patient has got a very, very large tumor extending supracellar and compressing the optic nerve and the arteries. And let me play you the video. So here we can see a fantastic view of the, so we have taken out most of the tumor. Okay, there's a bit of tumor there. And up on the top here, you can see the optic chiasm. Okay, and that's the dome of the tumor. So we have reduced the tumor and we are bringing it downwards. And right at the back here, that's the pituitary stalk. And you can see some arteries here. Okay, so that's the kind of view that we get today when we are doing this kind of operations. So almost all brain surgery is done under microscopes or on endoscopes. That's the pre-op and post-op scan, okay? Now, what we can't, so the difference of neurosurgery and any other surgery is that we don't have clearance margins, right? We will never talk about, we have one centimeter clearance margin. We always operate from inside out. And whatever we leave behind, we then depend on radiotherapy to help us sort the problem. In the old days, we used to give whole brain radiotherapy. Today, we are giving more stereotactic. So the same principles that I showed you earlier, how we do biopsies and we cut out tumors. So people are using this and they deliver the, radio, the radiation in the same precise manner. So instead of the probe tip hitting the tumor that you saw just now, the radiation focuses to the center. And that's the principle of the gamma knife. So patients always come and say, uh, and I always tell them, look, they use the word knife here, gamma knife. X knife, uh, cyber knife is simply because everybody wants to imply that this is as accurate as surgery, as the knife, okay? But what they're doing is just like what I did with the tumor when I did the biopsy, here they mark the tumor out and then they deliver radiation from different angles just to that area. So the, the famous one, of course, is the gamma knife now. It's a flavor of the month, marketed very well. But there are other systems that deliver similar things like we have the Novalis, uh, there was a cyber knife before, there was an X knife before that, okay? So what they do is they deliver multiple small beams. So as it goes through the brain, the small beams does not damage the brain itself. And all the beams that come from different directions, they all focus at one point. And at that point where they focus, there it carries out its destructive force. So the, the dosage is maximal. 
Now, if there is an error in the planning or if there is an error in the Q, uh, quality assurance or there's some kind of movement, then the normal brain will get hit by that very large dose. And so they develop complications, okay? And so, so radiotherapy is delivered stereotactically nowadays or they modulate the intensity. Also, there's radio surgery. So when they use the word radio surgery, they mean that they're only going to give it one single shot. That means a large amount of radiation is going to give, be given at a single shot. This is very, very useful treatment modality for small tumors, small arteriovenous malformations. But you cannot actually use it once this thing starts to compress on optic nerve and brain stem and all that. It is also very useful for metastatic tumors. So today, if I have two or three metastatic tumor and I've confirmed that it's two or three metastatic tumor, I don't give whole brain radiation anymore. I can give stereotactic radiation to each one of them. Okay, I have known people who have had 40 metastases to have been treated. Now, whether that is clinically good practice or indicated is a different story. But they can treat each individual metastasis they can see on the MRI scan or as the MR, as the MRI starts to show new tumors coming up, they can treat each individual one, so each individual tumor without hurting the normal brain. Okay unless there's a problem with planning and quality assurance, okay? So these are the main indications for radio surgery. So radio surgery is a big generic term, and the, under it comes the Novalis, the Gamma knife, the Cyber knife, the X knife, okay? So that's how this works. Now, chemotherapy is still limited in neurosurgery, simply of the blood-brain barrier, but in recently, there has been more newer drugs coming into play, and which shows to have promising uh, effects. Now, how has surgery become more safe, okay? One of the things that we do is monitor patients during surgery. So this is a patient who has been uh, wired up for an acoustic neuroma surgery, okay? And we, we wire the heads and we stimulate the brain and there's a whole team of people, neurophysiologists who are in theater, who are monitoring the electrical activity as we are doing surgery, okay? So this is the kind of screen they will have so if I'm doing an acoustic neuroma, I'm a skull-based surgeon, so they'll be monitoring cranial nerve 5, cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 8. Okay, they will, they'll have a plug in the ear with sensation. Now, when we are doing some of the bigger tumors, we will even monitor the other cranial nerves like cough, gag, uh, the other reflexes and all that. And, and we will, on top of that, we can mod monitor even the electrical activity going down the brain stem and stuff like that, okay? Uh, in addition to that, in Unisimulaya, the last seven years, we have an intraoperative MRI. So as we take out your tumor, so this is a patient, what you're going to see now is an intraoperative patient where with the head open, the patient will have an MRI done. So we do the operation, we do the MRI in the middle of the operation to decide whether we have taken all of the tumor. If we haven't, then we go back and continue to take out the tumor until we're happy, okay? So the MRI here, so this is, a, so to the patients are, neurosurgical patients are always pinned to the table. But now we have got a system which the whole thing is MRI compatible. So the clamps, everything's MRI compatible. A special gantry comes to take the patient, okay? So this is a pre-op scan. Uh, we can do the same scan intraoperatively with the face, everything covered up, okay? So now what he's doing is he's registering, just like you saw me register just now. Now the surgery is being done. As you notice, all the stuff around, everything is MRI compatible, yeah? And that's the tumor. And that's the view from the microscope. And now the, op the patient's head is still open, huh? They are moving the patient to the MRI scanner to have an intraoperative MRI done. You can see now here, there's air in the head because the wound is open. There's some tumor still left behind. That's air. And you can see up here, the skull is open. Okay, so they have covered it. They sent the patient for a scan. We then bring the patient back and then we decide to continue or not. So uh, the, the excision rates or the debulking rates become better.
it adds about another 45 minutes to the operation every scan intraoperatively okay and oops and then here you can see that's a pre-op scan and that's the intraoperative scan we have something called a spyglass so we can move it over and we can we can compare the amount of tumor we have left behind or what we have taken out so that's before we take it out and through the spyglass or the square bit you can see the bits that so in here most of the tumor has been taken out already and this is a tumor that's been resected on the left side of the brain In addition to that, we have an intraoperative CT. So unlike the MRI scan, here the CT scan actually comes to you. Okay, so we use this a lot for actually spine surgery. So we scan the patient after we have put in screws to make sure all the screws are in the correct position. We also use this MRI scanner uh, post-op to make sure there's no hematomas and things like that. Or some of the tumors which are very clear, we don't need an uh, MRI scan we'll use the ICT. So this ICT. The ICT is a little bit more versatile than the MRI scan because it's faster to do. Uh, it takes us uh, five, 10 minutes to get it done. And we have real time image on, on what we have done and our handiwork. So at the end of the operation with both an IMRI and ICT, we know what we have done. We know what we have done. We know if you have created any problem before we even wake the patient up. So the ICT, we use it for pre-op and intraoperative scan. We look at, we use it for screw placement for spinal surgery. And we also use it for electrode placements when we do DBA. One of my colleagues does DBS, surgery, deep brain stimulators for Parkinson's disease. So once the electrodes are in the brain, they use this to confirm. So you see the spine is still open and the gentleman is checking the locations of the screws to make sure everything is right. And finally, this is uh, the flavor of the month. Everybody's excited about it. When the BBC came out and they said, they showed this picture, the guy playing the violin and while the brain surgery is going on, well, actually, we've been doing that for a while, except we don't publicize things as well enough. So this is an awake craniotomy. My colleague, Professor Weyerman, is operating on a brain tumor in an eloquent area. And the neuropsychologist is there. The patient is actually awake, He's showing him some pictures and asking the patient to identify the pictures as the operation is going. So before he actually operates, they will stimulate a certain segment of the brain and see whether the patient loses function. That means that we cannot go there. No, that's a no-go zone. Right? So that's an awake craniotomy. So we use this primarily for low-grade tumors in eloquent areas. And this is the final slide. So this is the brain exposed in an, uh, in an awake craniotomy and they are stimulating the brain surface to see which part is uh, functional, which part is uh, going to create a deficit if we go ahead and operate, okay? So these are some of the things that um, I wanted to discuss today, right? The main symptoms, why we would do certain investigations. What are the things that, how is, how, how is it that we actually treat and operate on these patients? Um, because I think, um, I would be worried if someone wants to open my head, right? Uh, and, and, and a lot of it's hidden in the skull. So even the most the average doctor has very little understanding about things they do. And then there's all this bumbo jumbo about, oh, do I do a gamma knife or do I do this? Or uh, the doctor wants to do an awake cranial to me. So, so it's good. Your patients will ask you some of these questions, I suppose. And it'll be good to know some of these things. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, so Probinish, I want to ask you, does uh, all the benign tumors need to be removed? Because I've seen some patient who has a meningioma and the treatment was uh, conservative and observation. Is that because of the size or because of the symptoms? So how do you decide who goes for operation for benign okay, tumors? So, so some, some uh, today because MRIs and CTs are so easily available, mm -hmm. we pick up uh, a fair bit of incidental tumors, okay? So generally, these tumors are very small and they don't, call, they don't seem to be causing any problem. And we know from the natural history of a meningioma, some of these don't even grow. Uh, eventually, they become calcified and they're like a little marble in your head. 
So unless this tumor is growing, so, uh, so if I see a smallish tumor, if there's no cerebral edema, uh, if there's minimal or no compression of the brain, uh, I would possibly tell the patient we can watch and wait. Okay. Uh, watch and wait means that you will repeat your scan maybe every three months for the first six months and then maybe every six months. Okay. And then if there's no growth, then we won't do it. Okay. The same thing with pituitaries. We we quite often see a pituitary, a small pituitary. And as long as there's no uh, visual field defect and the hormones are not affected, uh, sometimes we will label it an incidentaloma. Okay, there's actually such a phrase, incidentaloma. And then we may observe the patient with MRI scans or serial, uh, uh, what do you call it, visual field tests. So okay. not all needs to come out. Yeah. Uh, the, there's a... Uh... A celebrity recently, she wrote in her blog and she was saying that uh, the brain and the spine is a different structure and not all, some of the surgery on the spine may have uh, more complications compared to the brain because of the space. So can you uh, elaborate about this? So do we, so we give a credibility because she's a celebrity or because she's a neurosurgeon now? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, it is true I would extend it a little bit further. The brain, the, the spinal cord and the brain stem are less forgiving than the brain. And it's a very simple reason, right? In the brain, everything is spread out the whole thing, right? So my motor homunculus occupies that amount of space and goes down the middle. But my spinal my, my cortical spinal tract is a tiny, it's a small thing within my spinal cord. So my spinal cord is a little bit bigger than my thumb in diameter. And in there, everything is there, right? So surgery on the spinal cord or around the spinal cord or around the brainstem, and the brainstem is worse. The brainstem, you've got the, the brainstem itself and you've got the cranial nerves. And sometimes some of these tumors, as I tell patients, it's like, it's like separating uh, chewing gum from your hair, right? So those two areas are, are critical, right? But again, uh, sometimes all these things are made a bigger drama than they actually are. Uh, if you have neurofibromas and meningiomas around the spinal cord, uh, depending on the size and complexity, they're usually not terribly difficult to take out okay, because they're extrinsic. But of course, if you're taking out an intrinsic tumor of the spinal cord, oh, that's hard work. That's really, really hard work. So my colleague would... Uh, so uh, where I practice, we are sub-specialized. So uh, I've stopped doing these things. I've got a neurosurgeon who just takes out sp spinal tumors. And when they when they do this, we have uh, intraoperative monitoring. You know, we are we are monitoring the descending fibers. We are monitoring the ascending fibers, uh, and all that. Yeah. There's a question from the floor. It's from Doctor Retana Velu Utosami. He asks about the quality of life after the brain surgery. Quality of life after brain surgery can be excellent. Yeah, can be excellent. Uh, it all depends on what kind of brain tumor you're dealing with. Um, without mentioning names, I mean, I mean, recently I recently I took out a, a big meningioma from a captain of industry. Uh, and 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 he's fine. Okay, he's fine. He should be going back to work, to his job as a in this position in a few weeks' time. Uh, but I always also say the brain is an unforgiving mistress. Huh? So uh, the the errors, uh, simple as uh, a small skip can cause a big issue, right? Uh, but neurosurgery has become very safe. Um, but you can see the effects straight away, lah. You know, also things like physiotherapy and rehab has come a long way. Um, and and so despite patients having problems. Uh, they are able to go back to functional status, a pretty good functional status. Uh, I, I, I have a, uh, another patient I remember, we took out a brainstem tumor, okay, and, and we left the patient quite badly off. He had a hemiparesis, he had cranial nerve problems, but within one year, he was back to running his factory, right? So, so we, you, you need a whole team to work with you, uh, physio, rehab, and all that. But the quality of life are, uh, the quality of life can be preserved. Mm -hmm. uh, in in uh, in next year, I'm speaking at the aging healthy aging society, right? 
And people say, oh, 80 years old, you shouldn't be operating on the brain tumor. That's not true. Yeah, that's not true at all. Uh, we have taken out meningiomas from 80-year-olds. Uh, the oldest person I know I've had brain, had brain surgery on is 92, right? Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and they can do well. The, the problem is as you get older, you only get one chance. So if you have a complication, it's very difficult to recover from the complication. Uh, I would say quite confidently that majority of brain tumor patients can be excised and continue with a good quality of life. Majority. Unless the, the tumor itself starts off in a very bad area. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Um, there's a question from Dr. Zainal Abidin. I think you have answered it. He asked, have you had a case where a patient make a drastic improvement post-surgical? I think you have answered oh, that. Oh, that's a lot. Nah, that's a lot. Uh, uh, it's... it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, patients. Can, I mean, we are not we are not blowing trumpets, but you know, patients will come in horizontal, cannot get up, and then after surgery they are walking. Uh, that's not uncommon. But again, uh, uh, I uh, it all depends on what kind of tumor, where it is, how easy to take it out. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so those are the cases that you think it can be operated. How about cases that you is contraindicated for operation? Uh, not related to the other chronic diseases like heart and all that, what are the brain contraindications for operation? Uh, honestly speaking, today contraindication for brain surgery is very small. Okay, it's very, very small. So it may be, a if I, if I have a patient with a deep-seated glioblastoma, okay, I will say, mm, let's just biopsy and see what this result is, confirm that it's a glioblastoma and maybe we won't do anything. Okay. Uh, I also have colleagues of mine, uh, like my the like gentlemen who are doing the uh, awake craniotomy. We will go into the deep parts of the brain because the passages and all that we understand today, and we'll go and take it out. So to say something is so the contraindication is usually related to the patient's functional status when they come in. If they come in very very badly, uh, we may not do anything. Uh, or if the patient has got multiple medical issues and problems or age issues and all that, then we may not we may not do anything. You know, uh, having said that, there was uh, not so long ago, uh, about two years ago, uh, I had a meningioma compressing a brainstem. The patient came in, she was like 60 years old. The patient was very, very, very well. Sorry, sorry, very, very unwell in the sense that she was in bed. She cannot uh, swallow, but it didn't look like she was going to die as well in the in the foreseeable future. Okay. And because some of these people will suffer for a long time, okay? So in the old days, we would have said, uh, I don't want to do anything, you know, go back home. So what we did was we went in and debugged the tumor. We didn't take out the whole tumor. We took off the compression of the brainstem. Slowly, the lady is able to now sit up. She's able to feed via a pack tube, but she's able to sit up. She's able to transfer in a wheelchair and she's improved. Um, is she going to go ballroom dancing? She's not, but, you know, she's functionally a lot better. So there are things that we can offer them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from Dr. Narinda Kaur. She asks about your view on astrocytoma. What are the incidents? Okay, so astrocytomas, okay, in my in my institution, astrocytomas are not uncommon. We will operate on an astrocytoma maybe one every week, right? But astrocytomas, remember, are graded one to uh anaplastic astrocytoma, very, very benign, often seen in children. And we got glioblastomas on the other end, which is completely malignant, right? So there are a lot of patients with low-grade gliomas as well. So they can be operated on, they can be debugged. Some of the low-grade gliomas, we just biopsy and we just observe them. We don't even do anything. They survive for many years. Uh, and, and glioblastomas, unfortunately, uh, the results are still quite appalling. But there is some uh, uh, improvement with the newer chemotherapy drugs. Uh, yesterday, only yesterday, I saw this lady that I operated with a glioblastoma seven years ago. Now, surviving for seven years for us always was like very skeptical because the astrocytoma, mati mati, they will survive for maybe 18 months and then they're gone. Uh, patients who survive for more than two years, uh, very rare at one point in time. But today we are seeing patients who are doing four years, five years, six years, even seven years. But, you know, some of them is also because the tumor was in a favorable location that we can take out more brain than necessary. Yeah. So uh, they do better. But everything is very case by case. So most importantly, today, there are, there are new chemotherapy agents that are coming in uh, that are proving to be useful. Okay. 
Um, you mentioned about uh, surgery on pineal tumor. So this one may be not related to neurosurgery. I want to ask you, uh, if you remove the pineal gland uh, in the past, I mean, some, some of the readings from the internet, it says that it's a, it's a site of our spiritual enlightenment and all that. So do you see them uh, change your behavior? I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think the Hindus believe that the pineal gland is the third eye of Shiva, isn't it? Yes. Um, the the answer answer is uh, the answer is no. Uh, the pineal gland is a is a is a uh, what what's the word? Not redundant organ, but it's got really very little or no function in human beings. So you can take out the pineal gland, but there are very important veins that surround the pineal gland that if you damage them, you can infarct the brain. Yeah. Oh. So uh, we are very careful about pineal tumors. They are one of the most difficult tumors to deal with. Mm -hmm. Because it's mentioned that uh, the melatonin comes from pineal gland. So does it affect their sleep if it's removed? Uh, the, the patients that we have taken up tumors from, uh, there's not been a complaint. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, there's a question from Dr. Narinder Kaur again. If a tumor is blocked by angiographic procedure, why do you still go in and surgically oh. remove oh. it? Why they, will I think re they will revascularize. They will revascularize. So what happens is that meningioma that I showed you, the angiogram, so most of the blood supply now is coming from the external carotid artery, the middle meningeal artery. So we kill it. There's still a little bit of blood supply coming from the internal carotid artery, which we cannot treat because it'll end up causing a stroke. Now, if you leave the tumor more than a couple of days, it'll start to revascularize from the other bits of the, the new vessels that are coming in and will continue to grow. So we, we have to go and take it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, there's one uh, one of this uh, internet celebrity from from uh, US, and his name is uh, Daniel Amen. So, if you have not heard of him, uh, what he does is that any of his patients with psychiatric problem, you put them on a functional MRI or PET scan. So, and he said that he has discovered a lot of um, space occupying lesion by doing that in some of these psychiatric patients. So do you recommend that this is uh, a good practice in Malaysia? Because uh, if you don't look at their brain, some this is what he said. Uh, if you don't look at their brain, sometimes you are treating patients with psychiatric problem uh, wrongly because it could be some lesion that has caused their psychiatric problem. Okay. okay. I'm, not, I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't want to go there and disturb their work, okay? okay. But more often than not, the, uh, the psychiatrists that I work with have picked up have suspected something is wrong and have sent the patient for an MRI scan. And they have found chronic subdurals easily to treat. You know, patients, older patients suddenly start to behave funny uh, over one, two week period and they've got a chronic subdural because chronic subdural builds up over time and behaves like a tumor. Uh, I have had patients who have had brain tumors, abnormal behavior come on. Uh, recently, uh, as recently as three weeks, four weeks ago, I had a former designer of some sort and uh, there were some changes in their behavior or in their thinking, slowing, and there was this huge cyst in the brain. Uh, the, the, the story that I love to tell is uh, many years ago, I operated on this lady from Klantan and she had a huge meningioma, huge, okay? And so we took it out successfully and then she went back. And then uh, about two, three years later, uh, they, uh, when they keep coming for their follow-up uh, and uh, what do you call that? Um, and uh, I asked them, so I asked the husband who was with her, so has your, how's your wife now and all that? Oh, he says, oh, she likes to put more make, she likes to now dress herself up, do makeup, etc., etc., and all that. So I said, is that bad or good? He said, no, no, she used to be like that before many, many years ago. And then over the last, Five, ten years, she stopped doing and not looking after herself. And then now that the tumor is out, she started to do that. So it's the other way, right? Uh, she has stopped her personal care when the tumor was there causing this pressure. But once we took it out, she has reversed back. So uh, I will agree, I would agree with this person's comment that maybe if you diagnose something that anywhere in there you suspect that this is not a uh, in it may be organic. I think a scan should be done. After all, scans are easily available today. But also, I don't know, you know, uh, I, as I'm trained by the British system, you know, we talk about yield, right? We talk about yield, we talk about cost efficiency and cost effectiveness, etc., etc. 
So I don't know how many how many MRI scans you need to do to pick up a problem in a psychiatric patient, but definitely there are patients who are missed, uh, who are treated for a long period of time. So the problems, the things that are mixed, missed usually are patients who are labeled as stroke, labeled as old age, labeled as dementia, who actually have a space occupying lesion. Because the symptoms come on very slowly, very insidiously, and so everybody thinks that, oh, sakit orang tua, nyanyo. Yeah? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> your experience in UM has shown that uh, the the skill and also the technology has changed so much for the last uh, 10 to 20 years. So do you foresee any uh, major changes in the next 5 to 10 years, like uh, the surgical become more safer with robotic use or I mean, or whatever so, that's... So, so th there will be some amount of robotics coming into it. Uh, there are robotics already starting to make their appearance. I'm not sure how easily the surgeons are. You see, the robots that every all the things that we call robots today, for example, the Da Vinci and all that, they're not real robots. They're actually manipulators. So your your movement on the side is reduced, is fine-tuned by 10 times, you know. So you have fine movement. The robot's actually not using his brains to do anything. But having said that, there are certain robots that can do certain things. Uh, I have seen a robot, just you saw the drill that hole that we did, right? To do a biopsy. They have a robot design and to do just that. Can you imagine how amazingly expensive that's going to cost? Right? Um, so all this will become, but I, I suspect a bit of robotics will get will come in. Some of the technology, like you saw the endoscope and all that, those things will take off even some more. But I think the main improvement in brain tumor will come from uh, genetics, uh, designer drugs, and things like that. And 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 I think uh, I suspect even in my lifetime, <laughs> depends on how many years more I want to practice, uh, I suspect uh, some of these things are going to disappear. So a, a, a good example of what you're saying, you see aneurysms, we used to clip all of them. AVMs, we used to try and cut them out. Today, uh, a large chunk of aneurysms are coiled by a radiologist. We don't even look at the aneurysms, right? Uh, uh, some of these uh, AVMs can be glued by the radiologist or be given radiation use, using the radio surgery. We don't have to operate on them. So there are other ancillary top ancillary things that are also coming in that are going to make this survival or outcomes better. Okay, we have about one hundred and ten uh, live audience. Uh, one hundred and ten. Uh, wow, I'm impressed. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then uh, we have uh, arrived at the time, and it's about three o three. And I want to thank you for uh, speaking today. And uh, there's a message from Professor Nathan that you have to pass on to the audience. <laughs> you have forgotten. Oh, 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 gosh, I, I even forgot the message I'm supposed to give. Okay, the same one that I gave last year. So they have, they're having this healthy aging thing going on. I think it's it's in Penang next year. Yes. Yeah, and hope to see you all there. Uh, okay. and, and and I've been invited to give a talk there as well. And uh, and we'll be covering on brain surgery on the elderly patients. And, uh, you know, something similar to the question that was brought up earlier. Okay. So with that, uh, thank you for your time and also thank you for, your, the, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.